The Florida manatee that I'm going to talk to you about is a subspecies of the West Indian manatee. These adorable mammals gather in large groups at warm water sites, but the rest of the year they travel alone, except for cow and calf pairs, looking for food, mates and places to rest. But they do socialise when they meet other manatees. In November, just before it gets too cold for them, they migrate to Florida to find warmer water and will stay there until about April. Manatees have very little body fat and their metabolic rate is slow compared to other marine mammals. This means that they are unable to produce enough metabolic heat to make up for their heat loss to the environment. As a consequence, they cannot tolerate temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius for long periods of time. And this is why in the winter they can be found gathered in large numbers in warm water sites such as shallow, slow-moving rivers, estuaries, bays and coastal areas. They particularly like areas where there are seagrass beds for them to feed upon. Florida is at the northern end of the manatee's winter range and these warm water habitats play an important role in their survival during the winter months. When winters in Florida have been unusually cold, there has been an increase in manatee mortality due to cold stress syndrome, where they go into a state of torpor, which eventually leads to their death. Manatees also like to gather in water effluents of power plants, like the Temper Electric Company in Apollo Beach. It is believed that power plants have extended the manatee's winter range, but these are at risk of disappearing as aging power plants go offline and alternatives need to be put in place for the manatees. Manatees were once hunted, which decimated their population, and they were listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act in 1973. In 1991, aerial surveys began, and at that time there were only 1,267 manatees in Florida. In recent years, there has been a huge conservation effort to help protect the manatees, which includes minimising the causes of manatee disturbance, harassment, injury and mortality and protecting and monitoring the manatee habitats. And these efforts seem to have worked, as today there are more than 6,300 and as a result, in 2017, they were downlisted to threatened, meaning that they were no longer considered in danger of becoming extinct, but still could, if protections were not kept in place. This downlisting is controversial, and with good reason. From the 1st of January until the 6th of April this year, 782 deaths were recorded. There are no more recent figures than this, so it is likely to be higher by now. There were also 107 deaths in December 2020, with 41 deaths in November 2020, when the manatees would have just been arriving in Florida. The total deaths for the whole of 2020 was 637, so the death toll for 2021 has already passed that. The highest number of deaths recorded in recent years was a total of 824 in 2018. It is believed that the total for this year will surpass even that figure. These mortalities are so high that they have met the criteria to be declared an unusual mortality event. Many of the deaths have occurred in Indian River Lagoon, which is a 156 mile estuary covering a third of Florida's Atlantic coast. Preliminary information indicates that the primary factor causing these deaths is the loss of tens of thousands of acres of seagrass that the manatees feed upon. It is estimated that the seagrass's footprint in the lagoon has decreased by 58% since 2009. The seagrass is dying due to frequent algal blooms which block the sunlight from reaching the seagrass and uses up all of the oxygen needed for their growth. In December, there was a particularly large algal bloom, which depleted dissolved oxygen in the water so much that it killed many fish, and any remaining seagrass also died, which led to the manatees starving. Why the algal blooms are forming in the first place is a little complicated. Over a century ago, the early European settlers drained the Everglades to raise pineapples and citrus. The Everglades are now half the size they were a hundred years ago. A network of canals, levees and water control structures were also put in place which has changed the natural ecosystem. Lake Okeechobee is connected to the lagoon by the Okeechobee Canal and the St. Lucie River 
which ultimately drains the lake water into the Atlantic Ocean. Before humans altered the ecosystem, water flowing from the Kissimmee Valley by the Kissimmee River would take six to eight months to release the water produced in the wet season into Lake Okeechobee. Now, it only takes a month. The consequence of this is that phosphorus and nitrogen added to the watershed by runoff from fertilizers, sewage, and leaks from septic tanks are not naturally cleansed before reaching Okeechobee Lake. So the lake is extremely polluted and algal blooms occur frequently. Also, the level of the water in the lake rises rapidly and high levels of water have drowned out as much as 70 square miles of plant communities. The Herbert Hoover Dyke surrounding the lake cannot withstand very high levels before a breach of the levee would occur which would result in the town's nearby flooding. As a consequence, water is released into the coastal estuaries adding nutrient-rich water to the lagoon and so causing algal blooms here where the manatees forage for food. It is estimated that almost two and a half million pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus from agricultural chemicals, lawn fertilizers and leaky septic tanks flow into the lagoon each year. The Indian River also receives local runoff which contributes to the amount of nutrients that enter the lagoon. A similar story is occurring in Florida's southwest coast here, water from Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee Basin are being flushed into the Caloosahatchee River and the discharges are contributing to algal blooms in the Caloosahatchee estuaries ecosystem. This is another area that manatees are found in the winter, but this winter most deaths have occurred in the Indian River Lagoon. So what does the future hold for the Florida manatees? Well, as always, there are many people fighting to save these awesome mammals. People in local communities have been campaigning to clean up the lagoon for more than a decade and by 2030 it is hoped that the local towns will be able to cut nitrogen and phosphorus in half. Old septic tanks are being repaired or replaced and projects to reduce the phosphorus content of wastewater from the Fleming Island Regional Wastewater Plant are underway. In 2016, Local residents also voted in favour of contributing to a $300 million tax to finance a 10-year clean-up project. So far, volunteers have planted mangroves and started oyster gardens, which filter water and absorb excess nutrients. But by the looks of the mortality figures this year, these strategies are not working, and downlisting the manatees to threatened looks premature. As well as dealing with a lack of food, Manatees are also frequently hit by boats. In 2020, a total of 593 Florida manatees died, which included 90 from boat strikes. There are manatee protection zones in which various rules that have been established by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission need to be followed, such as restricting the speed of vessels to protect manatees from harmful collisions and from harassment. In areas that are especially important to manatees, the rules can prohibit or limit entry into an area, as well as restrict what activities can be performed in this area. But in some cases, permits are available to allow a person to operate a vessel at speeds greater than those allowed by manatee protection rules, or to enter an area where a rule prohibits or limits access, such as for research and education, construction, maintenance and repair, and commercial fishing, but perhaps this needs to be reassessed. It is advisable to wear polarised sunglasses while operating a boat, as this makes it easier to see the manatees underwater, and also watch for manatees snout or back when the animal surfaces to breathe or dives. A swirl or flat spot is created when the manatee swims. If manatees are very ill or hurt, then they can be rescued. Biologists from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission work with a network of agencies and organisations to rescue manatees and transport them to one of four critical care facilities for treatment. Once a manatee has recovered, it is released back into the wild with tracking gear so that its health and readaption to the world can be monitored by the Manatee Rehabilitation Partnership but obviously it would be better if they were not starving or hit by boats in the first place. The problem of not having enough to eat isn't going to go away. 
there isn't suddenly going to be enough seagrass for them next winter. And manatees are creatures of habit. They will come back to their same favourite overwintering place and not have enough to eat. The solutions to prevent algal blooms are quite simple, to stop polluting the water. But they need to be implemented quickly and pleased rigorously if we are to save these adorable Florida manatees.